today, well, actually, before I start, I'd just like to say this is going to be a little bit, uh, hopefully, a complimentary message to what David gave last week. I really appreciate what he dove into with uh, the law and grace and where he went, and that's been on my mind a lot lately, but I'm actually going to take it in a little bit of a different direction, so hopefully it uh, weaves together well with what he spoke on last week. So, just get going. So I'll start with the title for the message. The title of the message is Investigating the Corruption of Law and Grace. Investigating the Corruption of Law and Grace. So today what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of an investigation. We're going to approach it from that angle. So when something or an idea or a concept becomes corrupted, such as laws, a computer file, person, a politician, you have to do some investigating, don't you? You have to go back and find out where did that happen? Where did that get off track? Where did the corruption take place? And how did it take place? And so you go through this process of investigation to get back to what the original intent is that was not corrupted. And so, for an example, in the case of a politician, we might use the term follow the money, right? You know, if you want to find out why a politician's doing what a politician is doing, we use the term follow the money which means you're going to see where that money comes from and what's motivating that politician to have that approach or to change his ways. It's a way of saying who profits the most from it. You know, who's behind the scenes making this corruption or this change? Ultimately, following the money will take you back to the person responsible for the corruption. This just tends to go that way, at least in that scenario. In this case, in the case of a corrupted understanding of law and grace, we already know who's responsible, and that's Satan. He's the one that corrupts the word of God. He tries to twist it and keep people from understanding its true meaning and true understanding. So with that established, what we'd like to do is look at the where, the how, and the why. So in this investigation, that's where we'll ultimately end up, is looking at the where, the how, and the why. But before we go there, it's important to know the origin of something. If something's corrupted, it's important to know where that original idea came from so you can get to the original intent and get through the twisting and the corruption that has happened since that original intent. We need to find out when the concept of law and grace was established. So let's do that first. Let's dive into that. So a question for you to just kind of think about, when do you think the concept of law and grace was established? If you were asked that question, where would you go in the history of the Word of God to say, okay, this is where it started, this is where that concept was established, or the origin of the concept? Do you have an idea where you'd go? Some, you know, in the mainstream Christianity and Christian world, would answer that question by saying, well, it happened at the cross. It happened when Christ died. They would say that's when grace took over, the law was done away with. That's when the concept of law and grace came into it. And some people might go a little further and they might go, well, you know, if you look at Paul's writings to Rome and to Ephesus and to Galatians, you know, he's the one that really established law and grace. You know, he spoke on it so much and he's the one that really brought that concept into being. Is that where it originated? See, it's really important for us to dive into this and find out where this concept really originated from. Not understanding the origin of things is like walking past two strangers on a sidewalk who are having an argument, and in that five seconds that you get to hear them as you walk by, it's like trying to make a judgment on that argument based on the five seconds that you heard walking by. You have no context. You don't know where the origin of the argument came from. You don't know what they're arguing in over, most likely. So how would you make a judgment and help those people in that five-second glimpse? You would have to get down to, if you're trying to help somebody, you'd have to get down to what the origin of that argument was about, wouldn't you? So if you believe the origin of law and grace, started with Paul or with Christ, it's very similar to walking by an argument on the street. 
and getting a five second glimpse and then trying to have that discussion. It'd be unprofitable. You won't be able to help somebody with the concept of law and grace by having that five second glimpse into it. It will be unproductive. And this is especially important when you look at Paul's writings. It's really, really good to get down to the origin of law and grace. Because you've got to remember, Paul, when he spoke, he called himself a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew the law of God inside and out, didn't he? So when he spoke, he was coming from that knowledge and that background. So as he spoke upon that, it would be good for us to consider what Paul knew and actually look into the law of God and the words of God and find the same origin that Paul was referring to so that we can come to the same conclusion and understanding that Paul was espousing. Not corrupted, but true and right. So let's do that today. We'll kind of do this investigation. Let's start going through the Bible, and we're going to go through the Bible and start working our way backwards and see if we can trace where this concept of law and grace came from and see if we can find its origin. See if we can find where it all began. So today, let's go ahead and start by turning over to Zechariah 7. And we'll read verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> Starting at Zechariah 7, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the father, lest the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. So did you catch something here? The commandment of the Lord is to execute true justice and show mercy. That's law, and that's grace. In fact, if you want to look at that word, mercy, the definition of it, is the exact same definition as the term Paul most used in the New Testament. The definition here of mercy is Strong's H2617, Hashed. And, it's, and the definition that Paul used was Strong's G5485, uh, Hares. And if you look into them, you can do this Bible study on your own, but write it down and look into it. They share the same common definition, such as kindness, favor, loving kindness, goodwill, or goodness, mercy, or merciful. These two share the same definition. So when we look in the Old Testament, we can see that mercy and grace are very similar. I mean, almost exact. You can also do a study into justice. If you think about it, justice requires having something to be just about a law. There is a law that justice is referring to. So what we're seeing here when God talks about justice and mercy, he's talking about law and grace. Different words, different terms, same exact thing. So we see that in Zechariah 7. Let's go ahead and turn back a little bit further. Let's go over to Malachi 6.8. I'm sorry, let's go to Micah 6.8. <clears throat> so in Micah 6.8, a lot of us might be familiar with this one, but let's read it again. It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Do justly, love mercy. Keep the law, have grace. This concept is alive and existing at the time of Micah. And it's interesting here because if you really think about what's being said here, this is a commandment to us. It's not just knowledge to have, it's actually how we're supposed to behave and how we're supposed to live our lives. A godly man or a godly woman will do justice, will love mercy, and will walk humbly with their God. Those are actions we will take and we will be in our whole core of who we are. That is how we will exist and how we will process life if we are godly men and women. So did it start there? Do you think that's where law and grace, the concept of law and grace came from? Did it start in Micah? Well, let's turn back to Psalms. Let's turn back to Psalms 25 and read verses 6 through 10. 
This is King David. So starting Psalm 25, verse 6. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Do you see the concept there? The humble, he teaches justice. He teaches the law. He teaches the way. God is a God of mercy. This is law and grace. King David knew law and grace. You can go through all the Psalms and see how he spoke to his God and how he understood God. You know, in the kingdom, I'll just tell you this. King David won't have any issue with Paul's writings. He won't. He'll understand them completely. He gets the concept. The concept was around long before Paul started speaking about it. And King David knew it intimately, and King David was a man after God's own heart. So is this where it started? Did it start with King David? Did King David, being a man after God's own heart, receive this knowledge and understanding from God? Is this where it sprung forth? Well, let's go ahead and turn back to Deuteronomy. Let's continue going backwards here. We're going to go over and turn over to Deuteronomy 5 and read verses 8 through 10. This is part of the Ten Commandments. Dan touched on it earlier. You shall not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God, visiting the children to the third and fourth generation, to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. My focus is on verse 10. Did you read that? Showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Commandments, laws, mercy, grace. The concept of law and grace was written into the Ten Commandments. It's not a new concept. But is this where it started? Is this where God revealed law and grace to everybody? Is this where it, the origin is? Well, let's turn back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis, verse 3. And we'll start in verse, or chapter 3, I should say, and we'll start in verse 2. We'll read verse 2 and 3, and then we're going to jump down to 7, 11, and kind of just talk about that and then move on to another verse. So Genesis 2, or Genesis 3, starting in verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So I want to stop right here. Does that sound like a commandment to you? Commandment's a law. So we have established here a law that Eve was aware of. She was telling this to Satan. You know, I know the law. I know what God said. This is what he said. This is the commandment to me. Well, we know the story. We know that they both ate of the fruit, the fall of man. And we know in verses 7 through 11, um, God comes along, finds them in the garden. They've got leaves sewn on to cover themselves up, and that's really what gives away that they have eaten from the tree. God goes, who told you you're naked? So let's drop down to verse 21, though, because I think this is a verse that in this story we, re we will read through and we'll kind of pass it, and we don't really stop to meditate on it or think about it, but it actually is quite revealing if we do take some time to think about it. So let's go down to verse 20, 21. Chapter 3 in Genesis. Also for Adam and for his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin, and he clothed them. Simple thing, right? We can read right past that and not really give it some thought. Think about what just happened. That was an incredibly kind, thoughtful, gracious act upon 
Adam and Eve from our God and our Creator. He knew their embarrassment. Can you imagine? They, they were so embarrassed they were trying to tie leaves together to cover themselves up. They were aware of their nakedness. They were ashamed. God could have left them in that shame. He could have said, well, you fend for yourself. You know, figure it out. In fact, when they broke the law, God could have killed them and started all over. Why didn't God do that? Would have been within his right to do. They broke the law. They deserved to die. But instead, you see a God here who extends mercy. Mercy in letting them live. But not only that, but mercy in clothing them, considering them and what they're feeling. You know, I think about this when I read this passage. It kind of makes me think of a, a parent and a child. You know, and I can imagine God looking down on them and just realizing their embarrassment, realizing their shame, being upset maybe that they chose the wrong path, but then extending his mercy to clothe them, to help them through that embarrassment and that shame, to give them something to wear, to help them pass that uncomfortable position they're in. Can any of you see law and grace in this instance? A law broken and a gracious God who cared about his creation, his children. We're back at Genesis. We're at the start of the book. I mean, how far back do we have to go? Have we hit the origin of law and grace? Is this it? Did we finally work ourselves back far enough in the word of God to find law and grace? Let's turn over to Exodus. We're going to go to Exodus 25 and read verse 17. Exodus 25 and verse 17 says, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width. And you can read a little bit more about the description, and David actually went through this, or I think, and no, actually, CJ talked about cherubim prior to this. But we're going to go ahead and drop down to verse 21. So we have a mercy seat that was commanded to be made. And in verse 21, we continue on, chapter 25, it says, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Testimony being the commandments and the writings of God to follow. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, and all the things I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Do we see the symbolism here? What sits above the law? Where God sits, his throne, what is it? It's the mercy seat. He judges from a seat of mercy over the law. The law and grace are in the very heavenly realm of God's throne. If you want to know where law and grace originate from, it's a good indication. You see, this is the origin of law and grace. The concept did not originate with the Apostle Paul. The concept of law and grace did not come to us because of Christ's death. The concept was not established with Zechariah or Micah in the Minor Prophets. The concept did not originate with King David in the Major Prophets. The concept did not originate with Moses in the Torah. The concept did not originate with Adam and Eve. The concept of law and grace is God. That is who God is. So to try to tear apart law and grace is to try to tear apart your God and his very character. Do you understand why Satan wants to corrupt it?
Do you understand how he tries to deceive and corrupt and distort law and grace so that we will not understand who our God is and be able to walk with him? This is an extremely important concept. It is who our God is, and it is who we have to be. Today, I just wanted to walk backwards with you, and I know we are going to end a little bit short here, but next time I speak, I want to actually go in the other direction. Today, we went backwards through the Word of God and to see where the origin of law and grace came from. Next time I speak, I actually want to turn things around and walk through the Word of God from where we're at right now and then answer the questions of where, how, and why the concept of law and grace was corrupted. And we can do that. And when we do that, hopefully, as we walk through it, you'll understand Paul much more clearly and how he was speaking and what he was speaking on. And hopefully, it will help all of us to understand our God more clearly, draw closer to him, and to be able to walk humbly with him.